Good morning, everybody. I am so excited that you're here for yet another Savvy Seniors Living seminar, or in this case, webinar. Uh, we've been bringing you these uh, free seminars or webinars since June 2027, if you can believe it. And I can see by the attendee list that we've got a lot of groupies here today. And I see some newbies as well, some brand new names. So I just love that um, you all are helping to spread the word about these uh, seminars. And today's topic, I think, is really important because I think um, it touches almost everyone here today, um, whether it will be ourselves, a family member, a friend. Uh, we're going to know somebody that's going to want to need this information. So <clears throat> first of all, I just want to, um, you know, I want to do a little housekeeping and, um, and let you know that, um, you know, we realize that as you're making choices about how you're going to age and how you're going to grow older, you know, being educated and informed is key. So, you know, that's what the series all, is all about. Uh, you finding answers, solutions to your answers, options. There's not any one way to go here. Um, and, you know, giving you the courage really to face those decisions and make the right choices for yourself with confidence. But we could not bring you this series without our amazing sponsors. So I need to give them a quick shout out because they help bring this uh, to you every month. And uh, when I ask a lot of you hear about this uh, from the papers, we're on social media. So I'd love to hear from you how you heard about the series. But um, as a reminder, the platinum sponsors are um, Annalise Morris with Merrill Lynch. Uh, we have Mike Awadawa with Care Patrol. We have um, Paula Rio with uh, Byron Park, who's one of our speakers today, and the Dana Wilson real estate team. Um, the silver level is the Avedekian Law Group, Carlton, um, Martinez slash Pleasant Hill, Efficiency Matters, Arosa Care, Mutual of Omaha Mortgage, and Oakmont, who is also one of our speakers today. So thank you again, amazing sponsors. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all back next year. Uh, last housekeeping is next month, November 3rd. The topic will be living with purpose and leaving your legacy. So I think you're going to want to uh, attend that one as well. So uh, without further ado, um, you know, a lot of you that have attended these before have listened in or uh, watched our panel talk about all different types of 55 plus living options. And there is a plethora of them out there. Uh, we've had just a panel on just assisted living. We've had a panel on CCNRs, life plan communities. We've talked just about independent living options. And today we're uh, giving it a little twist and we're going to compare assisted living to independent living and what they are and what they are not. So there's a lot of similarities, but uh, a lot of differences as well. So we're just gonna start out by asking our panelists if they would introduce themselves, kind of tell us a little bit about their role, their experience in senior living. Um, and we'll start with Paula. Hi everybody, good morning. And first of all, thank you very much, Dana, for having me today, having us today. Uh, my name is Paola and I'm one of the sales directors for Byron Park Senior Living in Walnut Creek. We are outside of Rossmore on Tice Valley Boulevard, so in that central Walnut Creek area. I've been here for about a year and prior to this I spent eight years in the upscale hotel and hospitality industry. Nice, and you're still giving them great hospitality, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, who are you? Good morning, Peter Nixdorf Dork with Carlton Senior Living. I've been with Carlton for almost 15 years. Uh, I left for a couple of years to be a director for a faith-based assisted living and memory care in Marin and traded the commute to come back to IL. So very excited to be back. Good nice. Morning. And I want to remind all you experts that when you're using 
initials or, you know, abbreviated things that maybe some uh, attendees don't know what you're talking about. IL, independent living, right? Michaela, tell us who you are. Good morning, everyone. I'm Michaela Olson. I'm the marketing director at Montecito Senior Living here in Concord. Thank you again, Dana, for having us join the panelists today. Um, I have been helping seniors through this journey of the next steps in their lives for, I, I don't really want to tell you how long, it's over 40 years. And I've been at Montecito for 10 of those 40 years. So I'm happy to be here and share some, some insights with you all and help you navigate this, these challenging waters and um, what the next steps might be. Excellent. Well, thank you all again for being here, your time, your energy and your wisdom and sharing your experience. Uh, Peter, thinking about the people that move to your community, what are the top three reasons you would say that they move instead of just staying in their own homes? Could you tell us a little bit about that? What do you see? Sure. Good, uh, that's a great question. I, I think older adults move for a, a few reasons. I know many move for the lifestyle, you know, not having to care for the home is huge. We all have an appliance go out. I replaced my water heater that was very expensive. Uh, so I think, you know, not caring for the home, which can be too much to handle. Um, and it's hard if you've also lost a spouse. So we tend to see that later in life. And, you know, if you're living at home, it's, uh, you know, can be lonely. So moving to a a community where you have support services, you know, hospitals, things around you. Um, I also see people moving for conveniences, things like not having to cook, uh, cleaning. We're seeing uh, older adults move for more like concierge services, laundry, housekeeping, transportation is huge. So I think those are really the few that come to mind. Those sound like things I'd like right now. Thank you very much. Um, Paula, same question to you. Why would someone move to assisted living in general? I think um, the first reason, I mean, I'll, Peter mentioned all of this, but a few others would include a little bit, having more, more of a layer of support, having someone available 24 seven, should something happen um, and not being alone for that, as well as some support uh, with needs day to day, um, whether that's small things um, or a lot more. Um, it's always nice and comforting to have uh, that layer of support available um, on call. Awesome. Michaela, what would you add to that? Anything? Well, not to mention the social aspect too. So lots of, lots of people to interact with on a daily basis, activities to participate in, um, definitely the house becomes a little bit too much to, to take care of by yourself. We can do all that for you. That's awesome. So we're gonna kind of jump around a little bit, but um, you know, I'm just sort of wondering, what are the different uh, apartment type options, Paula, in general, um, for assisted living? Maybe describe the typical uh, apartment or unit available in this East Bay area where probably most of our attendees are listening in from um, and the amenities that are most often offered. Yeah, so I think for any senior living community, it depends on where you're looking. Um, there are some communities that only have studios. There are some communities that only have one bedrooms. Some communities such as um, Montecito and Byron Park have studios all the way to two bedrooms. So the sizing uh, really just ranges to where you're looking. Um, and the amenities most commonly offered in the base rent uh, would be meal support, uh, two or three meals, depending on the community uh, per day, so 60 a month approximately. Um, we also include housekeeping. Um, it looks different, again, depending on the community, but typically once a week. Uh, transportation in some cases, parking, um, and then of course, all the amenities that community offers, and they're all different. So some have pools, um, a coffee shop or bistro, a fitness center, and of course, all the programs and social activities that the community provides. Um, but really wide range, and it just really depends on each person and what's most important to them. Wow. Uh, Michaela, do all the residents in an assisted living receive the same types of services always? 
So they receive the same general services that Paola mentioned, but okay. if residents need some extra assistance with things like medication management or help with bathing twice a week or escorting to meals and activities, they can add those on as extra services. Those are the things that we, we consider the assisted services part. Got it. Okay. All right. So Peter, is there anything at all that would disqualify someone from not being able to move into an independent living community yeah. like yours? Yeah, good, good question. I think it's important to know there are senior apartments. When I think of independent living, I think of independent living in an age-restricted community or someone in, in a, an assisted living community without care services. Then we have assisted living memory care environment. So right off the bat, I would say if someone has high care needs, the inability to care for themselves, probably not appropriate for an independent setting. Okay. Uh, and then also the requirements to, in, in assisted living, you know, an assessment, what is someone's memory? Do they have cognitive impairment? Do they have dementia or Alzheimer's? You know, those are higher care settings that, you know, they're not safe in more of an independent living setting. So, uh, and then I think we also would say if someone needs full-time care, um, there are ambulatory issues that assisted living communities, whether it's, uh, you know, transferring, lift assisting that are better in a higher care setting. So people are driving, they're independent, they're cooking. They certainly would be a, a good candidate for independent living. Good Got question. it. Okay. Well, what about what about assisted living, uh, Michaela and Paula? Is there anything that would that would keep someone uh, from qualifying in one of those types of communities? I think that um, for assisted living, well, what one must remember is that it's support with the activities of daily living. And daily living um, is very standard across the board, whether that's dressing or escorting and things like that. If those needs go beyond that, um, then we need to relook at you know, what support the community can provide if there is a need for supplemental support or even a, a more uh, high level of care community. So, Michaela, what are those? What are those? Uh, can you list all of the the ADL uh, as as you say in the industry? Well, yes, definitely. So things with with, with dressing and grooming, um, taking medications, um, basically all physical care. If 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 you are if you need help with absolutely everything, then that could be an issue, and it could be beyond our scope of practice. There are certain prohibitive conditions that are not allowed um, under our roof, under our umbrella of assisted living. And what so, are those? So, what would those like, be? You, so if you had a, a trach, if you had a feeding tube, if you have a pick line of any, any type or any type of um, IV treatment, that's, that's against our scope of practice. And you'd need to go to skilled nursing for a temporary period to take care of all of those, those prohibitive conditions before you would be able to allow, be allowed to be back in assisted living. Got it. Okay. And, you know, we didn't talk about this when we were sort of planning um, today's uh, presentation, but what about when somebody does need surgery? And this is for all three of you. You know, you've had surgery. Um, you go to rehab probably first. Mm -hmm. And then if you come back and you need a little extra care, I'm hearing that maybe uh assisted living could help with that what about uh independent living peter so many senior communities are transitioning to add occupational and physical therapy on site and including ours nice in more of an independent setting you can layer home health uh, other services that are provided by the community in assisted living uh, but we all want our residents to come back healthy get back in shape so transitional care is huge and we can really, in, in either setting, layer in whatever type of care is needed with, you know, escorting, you know, assistance with bathing and showering, things that, you know, somebody that maybe doesn't have the strength would, would need, so. Right. Anything to add? Uh, anyone else? Yeah, and um, as Peter mentioned, some communities offer that extra layer. What I see often in, um, in my community or others, and as an example, is that after surgery, someone might go to rehab within the hospital, or they'll go into a skilled nursing community or facility for some time for them to regain their strength, and then they'll come back to our community. 
Awesome. So Michaela, what is the best way for someone, whether it be an, an adult child like myself or um, a senior, to determine what community is right for them? I mean, we are lucky in the fact that there are quite a few of them around where we live. And so it's a little overwhelming because, you know, if you Google it, let's say, I mean, there's so much information online. There's too much information online and I think it doesn't help. It almost just confuses, right? So how does someone choose, like, how do they go about the selection process? Can you help us with that? Of course. So we do recommend that prospective residents do take some time and tour many communities. And I think you have to determine what's important to you. Do you want a large community? Would you, would you thrive better in a smaller community? So size can be definitely a factor. Also, would you participate and, and, and utilize all the amenities? Do you swim? Do you not swim? Um, do, you like, do you like a full program? Do you like to go on excursions? Or are you a little homebody and you're quite, you're quite happy staying in the community and just enjoying the services that are, that are right there? So it's definitely a personal choice. And we re really encourage residents, prospective residents, to, to go and definitely go and visit at least four or five, maybe even six communities. What about you, Pella? Um, I think that those are all really great points that Michaela made. made. I also, uh, price range is a big factor. Um, mm -hmm. There's so many different levels of communities, smaller, larger, and prices. Uh, also, size of apartment, or do that, does that community have the particular unit that you're looking for in terms of size um, to bring your belongings in? Um, so that's also something to consider. Yeah, that's a good point, too, because I know, for instance, there's not all communities have two bedrooms, for instance, right? Or, um, uh, Michaela, we had someone move into Montecito who not only had a specific model, but they needed a specific view and a specific type of closet. And they wanted to be on a certain floor. And I think their name came up on the wait list three different times. And it was lucky number three <laughs> that we finally found them their place. And I think they've been you know, tickled pink uh, living there ever since. But yeah, there are a lot of things to consider uh, for sure. So Pally, um, Byron Park is a little different, whereas you have independent and assisted living. So, you know, how does that work within the same community? And then when do you see residents sort of making a move to the different level? Yeah, so how it works here, it's all in one building, uh, but there is, uh, you know, about half the community is on license for independent living and then the other portion is assisted living. So licensed by us to provide that support uh, with activities of daily living. Um, so I think it's just in the move-in process when a community is unlicensed and they're not quite at the, the level that they need assistance day-to-day -day with in physical support. Um, they can move into independent living and it's quite easy. You just pick the apartment and move in. Um, now, if they've been with us for years and they find themselves needing or wanting someone on call available um, or a structure to their day where somebody comes in in the morning to help them, you know, get dressed and then there's multiple medication reminders um, or they just find themselves needing more physical support, they can make that transition over to assisted living. Um, so that often happens, but um, because we have both levels in independent living, they're, uh, they're still able to provide, we're still able to provide some support, um, but much like uh, someone would do in their own home. Um, so with independent home care providers providing that physical support. Um, but it's really just a personal decision um, if the residents want to be in assisted living or remain independent. Do you have a kind of a number or percentage of people that have moved from independent to assisted within the community? I mean, is it most people that do that or just a very few? I'm just curious. I don't have an exact percentage. Um, okay. I mean, there's of course residents that move directly into assisted living. 
um, and then some residents who transition over. Um, I say that the, I guess it depends on how long they've been here. You know, I feel like if residents have been here for, you know, nine or 10 years, um, those are the residents that will likely become good candidates for assisted living in the future. Now, if they're, um, if they still remain very active and healthy, they just remain in independent living. So no exact percentage, um, but it's really just, I guess, like I said, personal preference. You know, does that person want that structure day to day and want us to, you know, provide that structure to them or if they want that flexibility to manage that care on their own? Got it. Hey, that led me to another question that uh, we didn't talk about, which is, what is the average age? I would think, Peter, that the average age, and maybe it's not true, moving into independent would be slightly younger. I wasn't ready for your question, but a couple <laughs> of weeks ago, I actually ran a report. Our average age is 83.7. You're kidding. I, I will add, and I, I think the ladies can, can add to this. We're seeing a lot of younger residents, maybe with care needs, maybe not as ambulatory, some that want to bring in home health or some services like laundry, cooking, non-medical into an independent setting. But then we're seeing many seniors that are older adults that are in their late 90s. Uh, we have a couple that are in fitness five days a week that don't have a cane or a walker and are very fit. Um, it, it's pretty amazing. What are your average ages, would you say, ladies? Well, age is just a number around here. <laughs> You're only as old as you feel. And um, I think our average age is probably very similar to yours, Peter, um, probably around 80, 85 or 86, perhaps. But we, we do have 180 residents in our community here. And I think Paula can contest that there, we, we have some very young residents and then we have residents in the upper 90s and even early 100s. So it's just a number. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, just our, curious. Youngest Tell us. our youngest resident at Byron Park is 68 hmm. and the oldest is 104. So huge range and um, moving into community, people do it for so many different reasons, right? So that's a testament to that. But our average age is right in the mid 80s as well. And that just leads me to comment that, you know, I think people think you know, if I'm 85, I'm just going to be surrounded by 85 year olds and older. And that's not true. People in their 60s and 70s and, you know, so all sorts of different people in there. Awesome. OK, sorry, I went I went off track, but I was just curious because you're you guys are you're all sharing really good information and you're you're making me think um, and wonder and can kind of come out of curiosity. So um, so Michaela, you get the hard question and anyone else can jump in. But you know what people are going to want. Well, what does all this cost, right? I mean, there's all these wonderful things and we have all these wonderful amenities and, and trips and excursions and laundry service and pools and bistros. It's like, what the heck is this going to cost me? So I guess, um, number one, the first thing is what would someone expect to pay? And maybe just take, you know, take a average one bedroom, whatever, and then how is that pricing determined? And um, I may have a follow-up question for you too. Of course. So um, pricing usually for assisted living, I can speak to assisted living, usually starts around between five and $6,000 a month for the base general services and the base rent. And that includes your free meals and usually personal laundry and weekly housekeeping services. So that's the base rent starting prices. And that's in general across the, um, the industry locally. Yes. Oh, okay. There are some communities so uh, I might like to add. So like, I guess I mentioned earlier, price is really something to consider. There are communities that are gonna be between three and four um, and then goes up you know, five, six. And, and it, it, of course it just depends on the specific community uh, and the amenities they offer as well. And some communities do offer a low income program. So those communities definitely have a, a lower starting base rent. And of course you do have to qualify to participate in, in those programs. Yes, yes. Cause I've had some clients want to move into one of those um, low income. And this one gentleman was hopping mad. Cause he said, 
they won't let me move in. They say I have too much money. <laughs> so, so that is, that's, that's kind of interesting. So what type of lease are we talking about, uh, Michaela? So month to month, usually okay. they're month to month rental. And there's no other fees? There's a one-time entrance fee, yes. Okay. So move into an assisted living community. And I think, Bob, Peter, you probably have a move-in community fee too. So that, that does vary based on the size of the apartment that you're going to be renting. So ah. that's how it usually works. So based on the, the square footage of the apartment home that you're renting, the community fee will be re a reflection of that. Got it. You know, something to consider in non-age restricted apartments. We, you know, it used to be first last month in a security deposit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in many age restricted 55, 62 communities, much like Michaela, you'll have a one-time community fee in that kind of three to four thousand dollar range. Great. Same with you, Paula. Yes, as uh, Michaela mentioned, it's based on square footage, the specific unit, and it's a one-time entrance fee, um, and then month to month uh, thereafter. So, if residents don't enjoy the community or need to move for whatever reason, just a thirty-day notice. Ah, okay. But what if? Within the first 90 days, I decide that this, I made the wrong decision. Do I get the community fee back? Do I get part of it back? I don't know. It's never happened to me. <laughs> wow. It never happened to me either, but typically uh, not. The only time I believe it would be refundable is if, um, in assisted living, as an example, we were unable to provide the care that we had planned for, then of course we would um, you know, make every attempt and then refund the community fee. It's usually a prorated refund based on the number of days that you've resided in the community. That makes sense. Okay. And, and I ask because I have a client, um, I have her home for sale in Rossmore right now, and she moved to an assisted living and decided it wasn't right for her. And so now she's moved to an independent living senior community and she's happy as a clam. So I bet you that doesn't happen as often as going the other way, going from an independent to assisted, right? Yeah. Um, and she's, she's in her late seventies. So she she's just- picked the wrong community. Though. She kind of did pick the wrong community, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, and, and she moved, I think, uh, within that first 90 days. So that's why I was wondering. So, okay, so we kind of have an idea of what all these wonderful communities charge. But how would somebody finance these fees? Um, I'll start with you, Paula, and ask, how is assisted living most often financed? Yeah, so most communities are private pay. However, there are residents who come in and they have a uh, long-term care, as an example. If you have long-term care insurance, um, you can, the long-term care insurance will pay, depending on what it is, a portion, if not all, of the base rent, as well as the care associated with that. Um, so we have residents, you know, that can that'll cover half, if not all of it. Uh, for independent living, it's primarily private pay. Um, and then, of course, there are residents who have a VA benefits. Um, again, that's something that they can use in our communities as well. Interesting. Peter, you were going to add a little bit to that, I believe. You, you know, independent living is private pay. Uh, mm -hmm. Kayla mentioned earlier, there are some low-income programs that are uh, make independent living very affordable. Uh, I always ask if someone that's touring or stopping by, are you a surviving spouse or a veteran? Uh, because the benefits called aid in attendance that I'd be happy to answer, put you in touch with, can provide up to $1,800 a month for a surviving veteran. I think it's 21, don't want to misquote, 2,100 for a, a, a couple uh, if they're getting help with, with some of the of daily living. Uh, kind of a misnomer actually applies in independent living if they're living under our roof in a protected environment. So it's changed over the years, uh, but the VA benefit allows veterans to you know, live comfortably and, and be well taken care of. Um, there was one other I would say, 
Uh, Long-term care insurance is applicable if an assisted living is providing care. I've had some residents that have lived here that then transfer to one of our assisted living communities when their, their care needs kick in. So uh, kind of a question when to, when to exercise that and when to best use that. And do, things like Medi-Cal, does that come into play at all? Not in independent living. Okay. Assisted? No. 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 Okay. Um, I do want to point out something. Um, I recently had a client last month who needed to sell his home. It was a couple. They needed to sell their home immediately uh, for various reasons, and they did not have the money to move into assisted living, but they needed to. Um, and so there are financing options that I can help my clients with that will pay for the community fee and that will pay the monthly fee and I get 12 months to sell their home. And so they can get the immediate care that they need and want and not be burdened with that kind of black cloud over their head. And then of course it's paid off when the home sells. So I just wanted the people that are listening in today to know that, you know, that shouldn't stop you if something changes and you know darn well, and everyone here, all of, all of us on the screen, we see probably primarily a lot of people that wait until a crisis happens, especially assisted living. We love proactive people because you get to stay more in the driver's seat and you're making your own decisions and you have more options. Um, but sometimes people wait too long, something happens and then we really need to get them the help they need ASAP. So I just wanted people to know there are there's help like that out there for the financial side of things, especially for the private pay, right? So, okay, Paula. What are the misconceptions about assisted living? Um, and I know that I know that they still exist, and I know that there's still a lot of people that um, just are really hesitant to come and tour a property, and I'm I'm not quite sure why. Um, and as soon as uh, things change. Uh, I am going to start those bus tours again because I want people to experience what all these gorgeous communities of yours and others locally are like. So tell us a little bit about some of the misconceptions. Yeah, I think that people are unfamiliar with how much the senior living industry has evolved over time. Um, and many people that I come across have this idea that a senior living community or assisted living community is something to stay away from. I'm not ready, um, you know, because they feel like they need to, they need, to need physical care. Um, and that's not, that's not what communities are. Um, I think the idea that a senior living community is a nursing home or a convalescent home is still a predominant idea out there. And it's, it's really far um, from that. How there are communities that may resemble that, um, but I and speak to all three of us here today that that's not what we offer here. This is not a place that you come uh, when you're ready to pass away. You're, you're here to live. This is where residents come in to live and enjoy uh, those golden years of their life. Nice. What other misconceptions, Michaela? I think Paula touched on all of them. Um, I, th I, do, I do think that most of our prospective residents are afraid to come for a visit, just to even come and look. I think they do have that misconception that we're a 1950s nursing home. Well, we're far from that. My parents um, are in their 80s. They still live in our home in England. And my mom refers to our community as, a, as the fun palace. <laughs> we have so much going on um, that works for, 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 for everybody. Our gentlemen as well. We have gentlemen clubs. A lot of communities do. Um, we, we cater to, to what you want to do. That's nice. Do the uh, residents ever get to sort of suggest different clubs or activities? All the time, yes. We have committees of committees and 
our residents' input is very important. We meet with them regularly. We have an association with the president, the vice president, um, all communities do. And we listen. We listen to what our residents want to have happening around the community. What are some of the more unusual um, groups that you have going there? Well, Cornhole is really big at Montecito <laughs> right now. <laughs> Cornhole. I want to come play. <laughs> yes. How about you, Paula? What's really what's really popular with you? Happy hours. We have <laughs> five of them a month, and everybody always asks me if we offer alcohol. It's full bar and it's oh, yes. so live music and uh I think those are more well attended at our fitness classes at times. <laughs> yes. So Peter, I want you to tell us about a day in the life of someone at an independent community. Um, you know, tell us a story about somebody that maybe you know personally or um, that you see that is really, really enjoying life right now. Yeah, I, I don't know if we have that much time from waking up to <laughs> at night, but I, I think in an independent setting, you know, we really supplement what the residents may or may not have the ability to do, whether it's it's not wanting to cook, but yet you can drive to Trader Joe's, the farmer's market, the ranch 99, and um, you know, cook in your apartment. Uh, many of our residents, we have 104 parking spaces. So covered parking and bringing that car with you is very important. And, and many times uh, an old adult will bring the vehicle and then it sits or is inoperable, or they say, wow, we all provide amazing transportation. I don't need to worry about my insurance in the car. Um, so, uh, you know, I would say, you know, walking animals and going for a bike ride and, and going to lunch and movies that is now open again, uh, but yet the safe environment, the, uh, you know, the safety, Supervision is very important. That's awesome. Um, anything else to add for a day in the life? Um, I mean, tell us the story of a resident, uh, Michaela. Well, I think the biggest complaint from our adult children is, have you seen my mother? <laughs> <laughs> because she's not answering the phone anymore. So yeah, so from, from, from waking up and, and starting your day with, um, with breakfast and exercise class, riding the bus to uh, maybe an off-site excursion or, or shopping. Um, and then, of course, all the, all the wonderful things that we have on our calendars that engage our residents with something physical or spiritual or emotional, fun, um, lots of things going on. They do tell us that you have to work very hard to be bored in a, in a senior community. So, But I do want to mention, and one thing I would like to be very clear about is that residents participate on their own terms. So nobody is, is harassing anyone to do anything. So you can do as little or as much as you want to do in the day. And there's no big tannoy or, or PA system saying, and now we've got water aerobics at two o'clock in the, in the courtyard. So residents very, very much participate on their own terms and to what they want to do. Sort of sounds like a cruise ship, right? You've got You've got the channel on a cruise ship that tells you all the different activities by the hour and you can you can do something different every minute or you can just hang out by the pool. That's right. That sounds really good to me right about now. <laughs> Lots of choices. I like, I like to call it the cozy cruise ship because it's home, but it's like a cruise ship. Right. Oh my goodness. So, okay, now we're going to ask kind of a hard question. Why would someone move to a community during a pandemic? Paula, what could you share with us about that? Number one reason is the access to um, equipment, right? So as far as testing goes, our communities are well prepared to test regularly, which is something that you can't do at home unless you leave your home, which we're you know, supposed to stay at home as much as possible. Um, also access to protective equipment. Uh, should there be an active case, um, our communities are the ones that are most prepared to um, you know, have the staff, have the equipment necessary to prevent an outbreak. So testing is number one, equipment, um, and then also to not be uh, isolated at home. So you have that layer of safety 
Um, but then you're in an environment where everybody is being tested, everybody is well protected, um, and you're not suffering social isolation at home. And, you know, when I talk to people daily, I think that's what I hear the most, that they just miss people yes. desperately. I mean, we're able to get out a little bit more now than we were last year. Things seem to be a little bit better. Um, so anything to add, uh, Peter or Michaela, to that question about the pandemic or even to take it a step further and, and share about, you know, other than the testing, um, is there anything that you've done differently? Like what has changed? Um, why, so why would, why would I move? Uh, and what has changed with how you operate since COVID? I, I would, we're at the forefront of resources for older adults. Uh, we had a booster clinic yesterday, which is out now. We have flu shot clinics. To Michaela's point, residents can be as, as social, but yet private. And, um, you know, these are even in pandemic times, vibrant, active communities, and we're doing the right things, whether it's sanitizing, you know, all of the you know, hand hygiene, masks, all of the personal protective equipment, PPE, uh, Dana, we, we all follow the guidelines and offer very safe environments, yet very active. Okay, that's good to know. Um, do most communities, do you think, and you, not necessarily yours, but um, I know you speak with, with other people in the industry. Um, are you seeing that most communities have more space now? Or are most people back to full capacity or is it sort of back to business as usual? Um, I think definitely um, it's back, getting back to business as usual because prospective residents did not like being isolated and home alone without interacting with others last year. And they're missing out on that social aspect piece. I think mental health is, is top of everybody's concern these days. And being around other people really helps with, with mental health. We're humans. We need to be around others. Whether we are or not, we do. We definitely do, yeah. I, think um, also, I was gonna just mention yeah, that um, many people uh, put on hold their search last year um, and then this year it was resumed. So we've seen, I believe, a very uh, increased demand for communities mm -hmm. at the moment. I, I will also that. add, we saw a real fear back in the middle of 2020 the unknown. Uh, and once vaccines were made available, this herd immunity uh, got over 70%. To your point, residents, people were selling their homes, they were moving to be closer to children, mm -hmm. really seeing a huge increase. Uh, now that children are back in school, I think a lot of people want to move before the end of the year and take advantage of pricing availability uh, as well. So we've seen a huge surge of, of independent residents wanting to move for all various reasons. Yeah. Well, and I've never seen so many, I've never been so busy in my boomers, zoomers and savvy seniors real estate practice as this year, because people did wait, I think. Right. So there was some pent up um, uh, needs and they want to take advantage of the real estate market, which is basically peaked or at its peak. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple other questions. So um, I've shared this before, but I've been doing more and more uh, consultations with people and sharing some of the great information like you're sharing today. Um, and I've got a, a workbook that I share when I do a consultation with a family. And there's a couple other things that I think we didn't talk about that I suggest people make sure and ask. So if you have a pet, you would want to know, will they take Fluffy? Can I bring Fluffy? And can I bring Fluffy and Spot? Like how many Fluffies and Spots can I bring, right? Are there 
I would assume maybe size and number restrictions on pets. Bella? Yeah, so we are pet friendly. Uh, we have seven or eight cats in the community and a few dogs as well. Uh, the size limitations up to 35 pounds, so no Great Danes, unfortunately. Uh, but most residents have um, smaller dogs. Service animals are also welcome. Um, but uh, yeah, again, it depends on the community. We are pet friendly and I know there are some that are not. Mm. Peter, I think you have a resident that has one of the more unusual pets. The, the question when the family uh, came by for a look, they said, well, what about our tortoise? And of course I said, absolutely. And then I said, guys, we have to figure out how we're going to you know, handle this tortoise. So it's on their balcony and we put up some netting. It hibernates, you know, a month or two out of the year. And to the other points we have, you know, birds, cats, dogs. I, th I think the ability to care for an animal, much like, you know, a, a child is huge, but then many of us offer uh, pet sitting. I have a resident that she makes pretty good money walking dogs for other residents. Uh, so uh, in some communities even have, I want to say Oakmont has a dog path. Uh, so we're seeing that more and more. Again, concierge services, you know, can you walk my pet for me, clean up after, you know, things like that. We tell, we tell families that we are definitely pet and grandchildren friendly, as long as everybody's well behaved and on a leash at all times. <laughs> the grandchildren too, huh? <laughs> So another question that I don't think I asked you, and I want to make sure I do, because I've had some people ask me, is what if a, my friend from back east comes to visit and she wants to hang out with me, but I live in a little studio. And so there's really no place for her to, to sleep. Do you have apartments for guests or family? You know, maybe my son wants to come and and stay for a week. Is, is that possible? Do people do that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we offer, we have a couple of studios that we've converted into guest rooms, much like a hotel. Flat fee uh, includes breakfast and they have their own space and I have mine. <laughs> nice. Do you have that, Peter? I had a guest stay apartment. Um, family members would come to visit their parents. <clears throat> Many will stay with them because we have some really good sized floor plans with the living room being separate from the bedroom so the parent can sleep. They can be on a day bed, the couch, uh, but then we rented the guest room. So you can stay in the area, you could stay with your parent. Uh, we don't do generally short-term trial stays, although we have mm. respite stays, but we don't have the same services that assisted living does where you're getting taken care of. Uh, in an independent living, you really have to go get those services to yourself or bring them in. So yeah, good question. Got it, got it. Um, gosh, I think, is there anything else, you know, I, I think, are there any insider tips? I mean, Peter, you and I were talking about this where there are things to look for, right? You know, what about staff or, or, you know, we've had some natural disasters around California lately, right? So what about staff and what about the other residents? What about emergency preparedness? What about safety? Let's, let's talk about that because those are all very real things. And the three of us, I mean, the four of us can all talk about that too. But Peter, why don't you, why don't you start out talking about, again, I'm the adult child, let's say, or I'm looking for myself. You know, what else should I be asking or looking for? Great, great question. In, in a senior apartment or more of an independent living side, which is equally as, as challenging, Michaela, if someone's lived in their home for 40 years, well, I don't wanna live with older people. That's not for me. You know, inviting people in and, and seeing the, the community, the, the floor plans, I think there's some really key questions to ask uh, and, and experience, you know, try the food, um, meet your fellow neighbors in, in an independent setting. Um, look at things like annual increases. We're all on a fixed income. You know, what, you know, what is the increase next year, the following year? Um, what is the turnover of, of staff and management? You know, those are all 
you know, healthy questions to ask. Um, everyone has a sales packet that has, you know, smiling people playing shuffleboard. Uh, but I really, I want them to, to sample it, experience it, and really get a feel because we're all, we all offer similar services, but then are very different and, and, you know, we're not all on the same street. So in a care setting, I would say meet the care team. How, what does the admission look like? Um, do I need to get a, a physician report? Um, will you do an assessment? If my mom falls, you know, what does the communication look like and how will I be notified? And will you, will you do a reassessment and, and change the care levels? I think those are all very important. And, and then, Upon admission, ladies, you can answer this. You know, based on my parents' care needs, you know, what are the associated costs? And um, uh, I would look at you know safety of the environment. You know, do you have evening supervision? Are there people after hours? You know, I, I think those are all very important questions to ask. Anything? Wow. Those are. I'm so glad I asked that question because those are, I think, really important questions to uh, ask and understand what is offered and what you need. And I would suggest that people attending today think about not only what you need today, but what might you need in the future? And do you plan on and intend to stay in the same community? Or are you looking at moving, you know, maybe more than once? knowing that maybe this place that suits you now might not afford you uh, the care, the things that you need moving forward, if this happens or if that happens, and then being okay with possibly having to move again. Um, so I think that that's, those are really good things to think about. Um, did you want to add something, Michaela, to that? No, I think those are all really good <laughs> suggestions that Peter mentioned. I think just walking through the front door and walking through the community, enjoying a meal and mingling with a few residents. And, you know, we have ambassadors and, and most communities have ambassadors that are residents and they help the residents feel, feel acclimated. So definitely speaking, having an audience with them and asking them how their move was and how long they've lived there and what their challenges have been or what they, what they looked at, I think, is just talking to other people that live in the community is a really good, good suggestion too. Interesting. Paula, anything else? Yeah. Inside tips, any inside tips? I mean, you really just have to visit. You have to see how it feels, um, pay attention to the staff working there, the residents, um, enjoying a meal like they mentioned, or even coming to an event, you know, join us for happy hour. Um, and also I think, the most important thing to remember is what does that onboarding process looks like? Once I move in, who's there to help me? We, you know, Michaela mentioned the resident ambassadors, um, but most communities will have a team that's dedicated to help the new, uh, new residents um, meet each other, whether it's new residents or residents who've been there for some time, um, because we all know and understand that moving is difficult at any age um, and having all the support that you need. It's really aside from the amenities and luxuries that you're purchasing, you're purchasing a lifestyle. Um, and it's really important to remember that. Hey, Dana, can I add, um, there is a website, the California Assisted Living Association, uh, that has abundant resources. Um, I also would look at reviews, and we're a highly regulated industry. Um, and I would ask about you know, supervision at night, number of staff, mm. how we prepare and handle foods. It, it, again, it's highly regulated, and I would ask the administrator, the sales professional, as there are real advantages of living in assisted living and, and kind of protected environments. But the Cala website is exceptional. Interesting. And what what are what is that website people will want to know? Cala, California Assisted Living Association, resources for adult family members, communities. Um, I believe there's like a cost calculator on there. It, but is it C A L A dot C A C A L A. Cal com. It comes up one of the, the first or second assisted living association website. It's very easy to navigate to. And that's for independent assisted living and family members. Oh, nice. Thank you for sharing that as well. 
Um, and let's see if we have, we're coming up to the top of the hour. We've got a couple questions. And I know that all of you listening in have more questions. <laughs> so don't be shy. This is your chance. This is your time. We're doing this for you. Um, so you can ask anything you want. Uh, and you can type it if you go down to the bottom of the screen and hover along that bottom black bar. It says Q&A. So you can type in there. So um, I think one of the questions was already answered and we were talking about allowing pets. And I think we covered that. I will say that um, I had a woman a few years ago that moved to a community in Walnut Creek and she had three dogs and their limit was two. And they made an exception. You know, they made an exception. Um, I'm a little worried that I can't bring my Great Dane, but I guess we'll have to talk about that offline. Only <laughs> later. Yeah, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> um, and then I think somebody did ask, uh, one of our actual, one of the co-sponsors asked a great question. In my experience, many people think that Medicare will cover the cost of assisted living. And then I think we already did address that misconception, correct? That it will not? Will not. Hmm, okay, okay. Um, okay. And another question is, will I have, uh, will I have another webinar about continuing care communities? So we have had those in the past and I suppose it's time to have another one. Um, I try to mix them up over the years because uh, the, the most popular ones we keep repeating and then we always sneak in, you know, probably about four or five new topics every year. Um, but this has been super helpful for me. Um, anyone else? Wait, let's see if there's any more questions here. Ah, really good question. <laughs> what if people are allergic to cats and dogs? Ooh, that's a really good question. Good question. What What the heck would I do? I am really allergic to cats, by the way. Well, you know, we don't really see the cats out and about. Cats typically stay in a person's apartment. As far as dogs go, um, they're not allowed anywhere uh, meals are served. Um, mm. They are allowed in the common spaces, but typically in no dining room or even at happy hours because there's food served there. Um, so you, it'll be rare that uh, residents you know, cross paths too closely with uh, someone with a pet. Interesting. And actually, I have yet another comment asking, what if someone's allergic to pets and doesn't want to live next to someone uh, that has two animals? Do you segregate apartments so that pet owners are all together and away from those without pets? It's a really good question. Not, not at our community, we don't. It just depends on the apartment that's available for the owner to rent. So no, we do not. They are interspersed throughout the community. Interesting. And I've even seen some communities that have a community dog kind of lounging in the front lobby. <laughs> um, okay. Any other questions? These are some really good questions, by the way. Any, anything last minute that I failed to ask any of you wonderful people, Michaela, Paula, Peter, did I fail to ask anything that you want to make sure people know about before we we end today? No, but if anyone has any questions, you know, call us and you know we're here all the time. And just to drop by to Michaela's point or to pick up the phone, hey, I've got a question. You know, we take it for granted that we do this every day and know what we know, but yet the adult children and families and older adults may not have the same information we do. So pick up the phone and reach out. There's no commitment and we'd love to love to chat and answer any questions. That is a really, really good comment. Yeah, because you don't know what you don't know, right? And so you, you do have to be proactive. Um, and this is just part of, you know, doing that what if plan I've been talking about since day one, um, you know, over four years ago, which is, you know, what, what do you want your life to look like? You know, we, we kind of start out, we start out with a plan. You know, many of us said, okay, gosh, I'm going to graduate from college and I'm going to get a great job next. And now I'm going to get married 
and then you might have a baby or two and and or maybe in my case you have the pet first if, if you if, if you don't kill the pet then you consider kids and then you might have kids um you know and then maybe you move and then you, you get through college and and so okay now we're retired and now we're well past retirement you know we've got grandkids we have great grandkids and you kind of stop planning and you know this is the chance to continue to be uh, the author of your own story, the captain of your own ship. And, and you do need to do some homework. You know, you do need to do your due diligence and your research. And so I'm challenging everybody to take the time to do that and really think about what do you want? Uh, what do you want this chapter to look like for you? And we're all here, like Peter said, to answer your questions. Um, we want to help you um, kind of have peace of mind that you've got a game plan. And you may never even use that game plan. Your plan may be, I'm staying right where I am. I'm staying put in my home. And that's that's a great plan. But then just keep considering, okay, but what if this, what's my plan? And what if this happens? What's my plan? Because um, unfortunately, life throws us some very interesting curveballs. And usually at the most unexpected and inappropriate times in our lives, um, so we will be uh, following up with an email to everybody. We'll have the information so you can contact all these wonderful um, panelists today. And um, I'll, I'll check one more time to see if there's any more questions we missed. Oh, okay, couple more questions. Thanks for hanging in there, panelists. Can you, can, can you practice a musical instrument in your place without bothering other members? Really interesting. Peter, can I do that? <laughs> yes. We generally are very quiet at eight, nine o'clock in traditional residential living. I've heard nine, 10 o'clock. I have a resident that bringing the bongos was kind of a point. And I haven't gotten any complaints. It's generally done, uh, not during the maybe an uh, afternoon nap, but maybe between two and five. And uh, absolutely. Yeah. That same with you, Paula? Yeah, we actually have a lot of piano players. So we have pianos, a couple in the community that uh, people may use. There's one in more of a private space and then the other ones in the, the common areas. Um, but yeah, we encourage that. And also the apartments are pretty well insulated, so it won't bother anyone. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, and then uh, we're back to pets. Are there extra fees for having pets? And how much? Michaela? So usually around $500 to have a pet. That's the one-time entrance fee for having a pet. One time, okay. One time. Mm -hmm. For us, it's $250, yeah. So it's and, and that doesn't go ongoing every month kind of thing? No. So. Interesting, okay. It depends. If Fluffy's not very well behaved and um, leaves deposits down the corridor quite frequently, Ooh. Um, that requires some cleaning that hasn't happened in a very long time, just so you know. <laughs> um, very good to know, very good to know. Um, okay, so this, and this is, this is a very, very important question that I think we do need to address before we, we uh, end today, which is how do you match the best facility with a couple that have different levels of care? I mean, and this is this is a very few times do a couple need the same care at the same time, right? We're all in different places. So, gosh, who wants to handle that? I can answer that. Um, we do have a lot of couples in our community, and I think assisted living communities do attract a lot of couples. And I think it does give the spouse more support if their spouse needs some extra assistance. It gives them bit of a break and help is right there on hand. You don't have to wait for somebody to show up tomorrow. It's here right now when you need it. So I think it's a very good option for the couple. So they both have um, assistance that they both need. That's a great question. I'll, I'll add that I've had residents that one needs a memory care environment and yes. will be in a different Carlton setting. Uh, he, he may visit their spouse. Uh, but then I've also seen in, in residential living apartments where you can bring in outside attention to help with maybe a, a need like uh, bathing, um, 
escorting care that maybe the spouse cannot provide. So you can really do that in an independent setting, but ideally, you know, in one of the communities that offers, you know, assisted living, independent living without care and memory care opportunities, that, that would be kind of an all encompassing environment. Yeah, well, it may not be, I know that some communities do have a memory care wing, if you will, or floor uh, to their community. Um, but what if it's not memory care? What if somebody just, what if someone's more independent and then the other person really does need all the um, activities of daily living uh, covered? I guess, do they live in the same room together typically? It happens quite often actually at our community where one spouse is completely independent and the other needs more care. They mm -hmm. both live in the same apartment. The care is provided to the person that needs it. And then the spouse can uh, really just take it easy and you know go back to enjoying life as a couple and enjoying the amenities without worrying about becoming um, their spouse's caregiver. Got it. Okay, got it. That was a very good question. Okay. Well, without further ado, let's see what time it is, 11.07. So we are going to sign off and uh, wish everyone a wonderful day. I'm going to remind you that um, November's, uh, November's webinar is going to be on November 3rd. And as you know, it's always a Wednesday and it's always at 10 a.m. Once in a blue moon, it's not the first week of the month, but Nine times out of 10, it's the first week of the month. Uh, and then December, proper planning to prevent disaster. So we're going to be talking about taxes and wills and finances and all those other fun things that ugh. <laughs> nobody really wants to talk about, but unfortunately, it's a fact of life, right? So, um, you know, please do me a favor and invite a friend to these webinars. Um, you know, we'd love to get the word out that we offer this and it is ongoing. And I'd love all of you to take a, a moment to give me your suggestions for topics next year so uh, that we can continue to bring information that we know you want and need. So uh, thank you. Thank you again, Paula and Peter and Michaela for your expertise, your time, uh, your wisdom. Uh, we super appreciate everything that you shared today and just for being there. And then we'll get your information out to everybody else. And I wish everyone a wonderful Wednesday and October until we see you again next month. Be well.